Now we're onto the couch. Mr. Fenbeck, we're back onto the couches again. So, uh, Michael is going to host a conversation and panel discussion. This is the last before we go into our broken par our parallel discussions at 11 o'clock. We'll be running a little bit behind, so you get a little bit more time, okay? We'll try to shorten it a bit. So your panel discussion is about creating change, success factors for initiating employment models. Michael, over to you. Invite your panelists up. Thank you, Caroline. So we don't give you a break yet. Uh, the break will be only later. Welcome to the second um, couch session of the Zero Project Conference. Uh, it will be about creating change, creating change uh, in lowly and medium developed countries uh, and creating change by uh, big organizations, large organizations who work uh, in the field of uh, supporting programs of, for uh, persons with disabilities organizations that really have the potential to change. Um, all the three ladies, and I would like to ask them now to come forward, um, represent those organizations. They run programs, they finance programs, they support programs, they evaluate programs in many countries of the world related to persons with disabilities. Some of them only in the field, one of them only in the field, uh, two of them as part of their overall program work. What we're going to discuss is the way they're doing it, how they're doing it, learnings they have, common grounds they have, differences that they have. So here, here with me to discuss uh, creating change is from my left to my right, uh, Leah Maxson from USID, Charlotte McLean from the World Bank Group, and uh, Guy Tant Leher from Handicap International. And I'd like to start with um, asking you for give you a brief introduction about yourself. Hello, good morning. My name is Leah Maxson. I am a democracy fellow with the United States Agency for International Development based out of Washington, DC. Good morning, my name is Charlotte McLean in Sapo. I'm the Disability Global Advisor for the World Bank Group based in Washington, DC. And good morning, I am Gaetan Blair. So I, I work for Handicap International as technical advisor on inclusive employment in Lyon in France. Thank you. So let, let, let's kick it off by um, pu putting some, some pillars in the ground to get some stakes of, about the field uh, that we're discussing, and especially the field that your organizations are, are working in for. So um, may I ask you, um, Charlotte, probably you start um, giving us some three or four minutes about what is the World Bank doing and what is it, is it doing, especially in the field of supporting persons with disabilities? Okay, well, thank you very much, Michael, and it's really great to be back here. I was here last year, so it's really special to be back. Um, so I think it's important to just say that the World Bank is made up by, its, by the member countries. So all 189 countries make up the World Bank. Um, and the bank has two main goals. One is to eradicate poverty, and the second one is to boost shared prosperity. And it's within that context that we look at ensuring that there's equitable distribution and that we have sustainable and inclusive societies. Um, and so within that context, we have a whole part of the bank that focuses on social inclusion. And that's where I sit. I sit within the part of the bank that looks at social inclusion, not just of disability, but of a range of other groups that are typically excluded. So it's the part of the bank that looks at the exclusion of um, sexual orientation and gender identity. It looks at um, the exclusion of indigenous people, and then of course looks at the issue around disability inclusion. Now, I also need to quickly say that the issue of disability inclusion is not new to the World Bank. Um, it's, it's something that's been part of the bank's agenda for many years. And we had Judy Human on early, um, earlier on, and Judy was the first advisor at the World Bank to, to, to begin to talk about the importance of disability inclusion. The approach that the bank takes is a twin track approach to look to, to find entry points into bank projects to, find, to ensure that we can include disability, but in some instances where necessary to support standalone disability projects. The approach that I take as advisor is based on three three pillars. The first one is to continue to build the evidence base. So within the context of employment, 
the inclusion of persons with disabilities in, the, in employment. The idea there is to tease out what are some of the good examples, where is the data, what do we need to be learning more about? And that's a very important piece. The second panel or the second pillar is to look at what are the entry points in existing projects or projects that are in the pipeline to include disability. So if there is a project on labor, to look to see where can we ensure that disability is included. And then the third one is, is just as important, and that's to build partnerships. The earlier speaker spoke about partnerships, and in that regard, the bank and my team in particular has established three very strategic partnerships with external players, because we recognize that we can't do it on our own. Um, and so now we have a partnership with all the players that happen to be here, in fact, today. So we have a partnership with the Nippon Foundation, we have a partnership with Lena Cheshire Disability, and then we have a partnership with ONSA. And the idea of these partnerships is working with others to leverage of what they do, to continue to generate good practice. In the case of um, Lena Cheshire Disability, we're actually doing a review in India on um, social entitlements and economic empowerment of persons with disabilities. So again, building that evidence base, which is absolutely critical then for us to enable it to be included in, in projects. So let me stop there for a bit, and okay. I'm happy to talk a bit later. Thank you. Leah, please. So the United States Agency for International Development, or as it's known, uh, USAID is the acronym, is the US government's agency that leads um, its foreign assistance development programming around the world. And the mission of USAID is, similarly to the bank, to end extreme poverty, as well as to promote resilient and democratic societies. Um, USAID has an annual budget of approximately 22.7 billion US dollars and it provides support to over 100 developing countries worldwide in areas such as economic growth, democracy, human rights, and governance, global health, education, food security and agriculture, environmental sustainability, and more. USAID takes on an inclusive development approach meaning that all of its programming in all of the countries in which it operates is to be inclusive of all people, um, regardless of disability status, of sexual orientation or gender identity, whether or not um, the person is indigenous or not. Um, so broad, broadly, a non-discrimination and inclusive approach. So when it comes to work around economic growth and livelihoods and employment of persons with disabilities, this approach of inclusion extends, um, whereby the work that the agency is supporting around the world on economic growth and employment is to be inclusive of all people, including people with disabilities. Thank you. Gaetan. So, Handicap International is a French NGO. We work in around 60 countries along, uh, alongside people with disabilities and other vulnerable people to ensure their full participation and inclusion in the society. So, we have different kinds of projects in emergency, post-emergency and development context, uh, from demining, support to civil society, rehabilitation, health, protection, and inclusion. So in terms of employment and uh, inclusive employment, we work around, um, in around 30 countries across Africa, Asia, Middle East, uh, Latin America, and the Caribbean. In terms of approach, we work at different levels. Firstly, we support uh, the emper empowerment of people with disabilities through skills development and DPOs in terms of right advocacy. We also support services to be more inclusive. So we work with different kinds of services such as social services, employment services, vocational training center or microfinance institution. We also support employers to hire and maintain 
workers with disabilities. And we uh, also work with uh, decision maker ministries to ensure the sustainability of our projects. Thank you, Kaitan. Uh, I would like to follow up on this um, very broad picture on, on asking you very concretely about projects that your organizations are running, financing, sponsoring. Um, I think the, the easiest to understand what you're doing and how you're doing is, is giving us each of one of you a, a concrete example of a project that you find is working well and, uh, and, and also characterizes your approach to it. Probably, Charles, you start again. Great, so I'm going to have two if you don't mind. So the one is to look at internally. Um, internally, we're, we're looking at um, developing a disability inclusion and accountability framework for the World Bank itself, for the World Bank staff. And this is important because what it will do is it will provide guidance and thinking to World Bank staff on how to include disability in their projects. So that would be very useful in the context of a World Bank staffer who's working on a project on um, skills development or vocational training in, in a particular country. So I think that that's, that's an important piece in terms of our own internal capacity building. Um, because I think for us, what we recognize is that there's often a sense among staff that they don't know what the entry point, they don't know what to do. Um, even if they think it's a good idea, they don't know how to do it. And so we feel like having a framework that explores that and articulates what our thinking is, and then sharing within that framework some good examples of what disability inclusion looks like, and in this case, um, disability and um, in, into the labor force would be very useful. Now, in terms of projects, there are a number of bank projects that address the issue of employment. Um, and I'm, I'll be the first one to say, most of them do not include disability or disability inclusion. That said, there are a few that do. Um, and there's one that particularly comes to mind. It's a project in, in Rajasthan, in India. Um, and it's a project that focuses on livelihoods. And I think this is an important issue for us to take into account because um, we, many of the countries that we engage in are countries that have um, people who are basically in the informal economy. And so when we think about jobs, when we think about employment, we need to think about it within the context of, of livelihoods and the informal sector. Um, and so the Rajasthan project has actually been, I think, one of, one of, one of the good examples uh, or emerging best practices because what it did was to immediately engage disabled people's organizations and to form self-help groups. So it was a very organic type of project. Um, and so that for me was already a good indication of success. Um, the, other, the other, I think, important piece around that particular project was the scale. So it wasn't a small, pro it wasn't a small pilot project. It was a massive Rajasthan project. There was a second iteration of that project. And in many ways, this is, this is the benefit of getting it right when you're an institution like the bank, because you can go to scale. Um, the challenge is getting everybody to get it right, and that in part is my job. Um, Charles, may I ask you one follow-up question regarding the first line of your work at this mainstreaming disability inclusiveness. What does this actually mean on the ground? Is this about changing application forms, training the people who evaluate projects? What do you do on the ground when you, when you mainstream? So when we talk about mainstreaming um, disability into, into bank operations, what we're talking about is how our staff articulate disability in their operations. And so it could be a project operation or it could be analytics. So for instance, a good example of, 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 of mainstreaming disability into the bank's analytics would be the most recent world development report that was on um, the digital divide, that looked at the digital divide. And within that, we were able to insist and support our colleagues to have language around the importance of accessible ICT, right? So that's one way of mainstreaming mm -hmm. from, from the analytical point of view. The other point is to look at projects. So again, if we're working on a project in Jamaica, and this is a real life project, we were able to ensure that the design of the project 
carries a component on disability inclusion. And it's not a standalone project on disability inclusion, it's part of, it's part of that social protection and livelihoods project. A strong component on disability that has indicators that, that we can follow up on and look at impact. Um, and, so, and, and so when I talk about mainstreaming, I'm talking very much about within the context of the World Bank staff, because that is, that, that is my immediate audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Lear. You said uh, characteristic, uh, good examples of your projects. Sure. So I'm really pleased to be here because three of the projects that the Zero Project Conference has recognized this year as innovative are projects that USAID has supported. Um, one is a project that was implemented by Save the Children in Armenia. The second, a project implemented by the Ethiopian Center on Disability and Development in Ethiopia, and the third is a project implemented by the Seraki Foundation in Paraguay. And what's interesting is that when you look at these three projects, you know, they took place in distinct and diverse geographic regions. They all achieved excellent results. And when I look at the projects, I can identify um, common features that I think contributed to their success. And so what I would like to do is just share maybe three of those common features across the three projects that I think um, were factors in their success. The first is that they were all market driven. Early on in the implementation of the projects, um, they conducted market-based research looking at what, what competitive employment looks like, what jobs are available, who's hiring, what job areas are perhaps not viable at the time. And they used that information to then inform the types of training that they offered um, to their project participants, to beneficiaries. As well, they used that information to be strategic about the employers who they approached in an effort to form relationships with. Um, and this is really important because the goal is for people to be marketable and to gain competitive employment. And so aligning program interventions with the demands of the local job market is necessary. The second feature of all three programs um, that I think contributed to their success is that they worked on both the supply and demand side of things. Um, I just spoke about the supply side in terms of providing meaningful uh, skills-based and market-based training to prospective employees. Um, yesterday we heard from Director Boss who said that, you know, we work so much on training people, training people, and while that is very important, it's equally important to create the demand from the employers to then seek out applicants with disabilities. Um, and that is a feature that I think was one of the reasons why these projects were also successful. In Paraguay, for example, the Seraki Foundation, who was the implementing partner, forged relationships with over 100 public and private employers. And they did so from a win-win approach, um, not only you know talking about labor inclusion from a corporate social responsibility standpoint, but really talking about the benefits of having inclusive workforces and how this contributes to, um, to better outputs. Um, and over the three and a half year period that Seraki Foundation was implementing this project in Paraguay, they managed to mobilize 115 companies who have now informally kind of established their own network where collectively they are championing, championing the issue of inclusion in the workplace. And one final and very important um, feature that I'll mention um, that all of these projects shared was that the approach that they took was to increase access to mainstream technical and vocational training as well as employment opportunities that are available to all citizens. So they weren't focused on specialized trainings or specialized employment, 
but really working within existing institutions um, to ensure that services um, and opportunities for skill development were accessible and inclusive to all. Um, and so again, you can look at the projects that Save the Children implemented in Armenia, as well as the Ethiopian Center on Disability and Development in Ethiopia. Um, and both were working with the state technical vocational and education training colleges, um, training the teachers of those colleges on inclusive um, practices. And for example, in Armenia, um, after the, after the four-year project, the results were that they had successfully placed 900 people with disabilities into 90 state vocational training centers, so increasing access in 90 state vocational training centers across the country for 900 people, um, and training over 1,000 teachers of these institution, institutes, training centers on inclusive practices. Um, and as a result, over, over 650 people with disabilities were gainfully employed. Um, similarly, in Ethiopia, 40% of all of individuals with disabilities who gained employment as a result of the project there were graduates from these technical and vocational education training centers. Um, and they received, they were included in the competitive workforce and they were at minimum making minimum wage. So I think that all three of these factors were factors that led to the success of all three projects. Uh, thank you, Lear. Um, also from the Zero Project point of view, it was quite uh, significant that uh, three out of 56 uh, innovative practices that we finally selected were supported by uh, USAID. So obviously you're doing something right. Um, Gaetan, one a concrete example and your approach on Yes, we have different reasons of success, but maybe the main one is the complementarity and the collaboration between different services we are working with and uh, employers. So, for example, in Morocco, we just uh, finished a project last December, a three years project. Within this project, we support more than 200 youth with disabilities. We work with local NGOs, which are working with four persons with uh, people with disabilities for identification, they provide personalized support and coaching. Then these people are referred to employment services, which are also giving personalized support and coaching. Then these people, uh, when needed, received skill development, vocational training, soft skills, um, job searching, searching skills. Um, so this is for the side of the support we provide to people with disabilities. On the other side, we also support the services to be more inclusive. So as I was talking before, uh, vocational training center, for instance, to overcome attitudinal barriers or accessibility barriers. And in the same time, we also work with employers. So in this project, we've support uh, 12 employers, such as AXA, Dell, Total Call, Phone Group, IKEA, L'Oreal, so like international groups, but also, also local uh, employers. Uh, and the key success of this support to these employers was the ownership of the top management of these uh, companies. Uh, we also support them with inclusion assessment, awareness and training for human resource teams, uh, then disability focal points. Uh, we support them to provide reasonable accommodation to adapt work environment when needed. And we, su we support them as well to develop uh, diversity um, and um, disability policies. And for that, we've worked with um, Employer Federation in Morocco, which is called CGM, which is very uh, involved as well in this project. Uh, in this project, one other key of success is that we, uh, HI is a part of the ILO, Global, Disability, um, Global Business and Disability Network, so it's at global, at, which means that at global level, we have some links with uh, global employers, global companies, but we work with the same companies in our um, 
in our countries of intervention. So we work with these companies in Senegal, in Morocco, in Tunisia, and uh, more and more actually. Um, yes, so this is one, of, um, one example in Morocco. One other key uh, of our success is that, as Leah was saying, we always uh, have market-driven projects. So, for instance, in Mali, we have a self-employment project in a very rural, rural area in Sikasso. And uh, to be sure that the project, the employment project that we will support will find um, enough customers, we've started to involve all the communities to ask what was the product and services which were missing in the area. So at the end, we, we've developed egg production, um, only, only product, she butter production, and different kind of uh, food um, processing activities, because that's the kind of products that were missing, that, that were quite expensive in this area. Um, another reason of success is that we always work with mainstream services, again, like Lea was saying. Uh, for example, still in Mali, for the same project, we work with uh, different microfinance institutions. But we, don't, we didn't ask to people, okay, we've, we have um, an agreement with this uh, MFI, we, we arrange some uh, product with specific interest rate. No, we don't do like that. We um, met all the MFI in the area, and uh, from the beginning of the project, to explain them the aim of our project, and that this, all the activities that we were supporting were market-driven, so that which, uh, so it's, 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 it may be sustainable. Okay. And um, in, in, instead of developing specific product, MFI product, financial product for uh, our beneficiaries, we support this MFI again to overcome attitudinal barriers and accessibility barriers. So at the end, the people we were supporting received the same kind of product that any any people in the area, so that's why this kind of project is very sustainable and that the people that we have supported during this project will uh, keep benefiting from this kind of product af even after the, the end of the project. Okay. Um, thank you, Gaetan. What you didn't mention so far is that uh, Handicap International has uh, published a brand new white paper uh, on, on uh, employment of persons with disabilities. I think it's available on your website for download and it includes a lot of, of, of interesting uh, research and, and expertise in, in that field. Um, we are already running close to, uh, to the end of our session. I would like to ask two more questions and uh, encourage you to answer very briefly. First one is, how do you measure success? How do you measure uh, your work? If it, if it worked, if it didn't work, and what is the success? for you, I think some of you have also very defined uh, criteria about measuring, Charlotte. Thank you very much. I did want to just quickly say that um, the Jamaica project that I mentioned um, had a life skills development component to it and trained over 360 poor people with disabilities and that was one of the criteria for, for the training. And for me, one of the challenges coming out of that project was the retention of persons with disabilities in, 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 the, in the labor force. Um, and I think that that's an important piece for us to think about, that it's, it's, it's part of an ecosystem, right? It's, mm. about, it's about education, it's about access, it's about trans accessible transportation, it's about a whole range of things that enable a person to, to maintain um, or, be, uh, or be able to Stay, stay in a job, and it's about attitudes and all of that. So, so retention remains a very important piece of, of the puzzle. Um, in terms of measuring success, I mean, I think, you know, the, of course we have um, very robust um, impact evaluations. Um, we've designed indicators, not as many indicators that I think we should have on disability, and this is a challenge. I think we need to, to look at what's out there. Um, I'm, I'm 
really interested in finding indicators that are measuring not just the numbers, but the impact. So I think it's really interesting to look at what is the, pol you know, finding indicators to measure the policy environment, um, to look at what kind of anti-discrimination legislation is out there, to find indicators that are measuring what kind of mechanisms are in place for grievances for persons with disabilities that are in employment. Because um, I think that may help us think a bit about or unlock the thinking around the retention piece. So I think we need to get past this indicator um, thinking where you're just counting how many trainings we've had, how many capacity buildings we've had, um, to actually thinking about what are the systems in place that enable um, people with disabilities to be part, to be part of the labor force. Okay, thank you. Leah How does USAID measure success? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Charlotte said in terms of really, you know, the focus needs to be on looking at um, the so what factor of all of the training essentially that is being provided. It's good to train, but, but, but so what? What's happening after? What is the impact? <clears throat> um, two indicators that USAID uses uh, to measure success of employment-related programming that I think are good ones are, one, the number of individuals with new or better employment following completion of um, workforce development programs, and number of individuals with improved skills following completion of workforce development programs. So again, indicators that are looking at the outcome of training um, to the benefit of people with disabilities, the quality of training that people with disabilities are, are receiving or that people, people, all people are receiving. Um, other, I think other things to be looking at too, potentially would be earnings, um, whether or not people are receiving minimum wage, steady earnings, growth in earnings. Um, I agree on the job retention as much as possible is that we can be tracking job retention of, of people is a good thing, as well as I think job satisfaction is another one. Are people happy with the kinds of jobs that they're getting as a result of our programming? Are we putting them in boxes? Are, are we actually um, you know, fostering, enabling an environment that allows people to aspire to what they want to be doing and what they know that they can be doing if given the chance. Thank you. Gretan. Uh, yes, in terms of indicators at Handicap International, we use what we call the quality of life. So we have one tool which is called Scopio, which measures this quality of life imp uh, improvement. So it's about social, economic, and psychosocial aspect, not only economic or the inclusion aspect, but the, the whole range of uh, impact that give, uh, which is given by a job. And this tool also measures measure access to basic services, such as uh, education, health services. So we, we use more and more this tool in our different projects. Okay. Uh, we you. also, Sorry. at, at uh, services level, we also try to measure the soci social performance indicators. So when we work with uh, MFI or even VTCs and uh, employers, because all of these actors have social performance indicators. And of course, we, we try to grasp the number of persons included and hired in these different services and mm. jobs. Okay. Thank you, Kaitan. And we are closing this uh, couch session with um, a, 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 an, an easy question with a different, uh, an easy question with different answers. But I, I still encourage you to do it in one or two sentences. What do you see for the future? What, what, what's next? Um, any developments in, in in programs that you see or the way you see it? Okay, so I'm not sure that's easy, but um, uh, I think I for me the <laughs> one important pa piece is to look at um, more financing and more technical assistance for uh, the realization of SDG 8. I think f I see in the future better implementation of Article 27, because I think that will then, you know, build, kind of snowball the, 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 the issue around um, education, uh, employment and, um, and the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the workforce. But I think where I'm sitting at the bank, um, the important piece is really about 
uh, continuing to generate good practices, and that's why you know coming coming to 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 the zero project is so important because I'm I'm learning about what other people are doing, um, but really curating all of that information and then being able to share it within the World Bank so that our projects can better define and better include persons with disabilities in the employment sector are very important. Thank you. Um, I would add the future is to continue to increase access to mainstream employment opportunities, mainstream technical and vocational training opportunities, and to do so in a way that challenges the status quo um, to raise expectations to where they should be of all people, regardless of gender or disability or X, Y, Z other factor, um, to take away the boxes that are limiting people and putting people in stereotypical job positions, and to really listen to what people want um, and and do do everything that you can get that you can to get them to that place. Thank you, Gatan. You have the final word. Yes, maybe to reach more people, uh, what we try to do is to scaling up the projects which are working, uh, the ones in Morocco or in Senegal or in Mali. Uh, for the moment, we work in uh, small areas and we just want to develop this project in bigger areas at national level or even at regional level to share experience between different countries in the same region. Uh, with technologies, we think that we can support more people by learning, working, and selling from home because uh, to overcome a lot of accessibility barriers. And we, we also try to communicate more and more on the key success of our project uh, to, to share good experience, good practices. And uh, the white paper you were talking about before is one of the tools that we use to, to communicate on um, to, to give information regarding employment of people with disabilities and to provide some recommendation that can support employment of people with disabilities. Uh, if people are interested, I have some, some copies of this uh, white paper in my bags and it's, uh, we can also download this document, just ask me. Thank you, Kaitan. Thank you, everyone. I think we did a great job and you deserve a, a, a great hand and a great applause. Thank you. Thank you.